you're a boy froggy. <laughs> Hop. Hop. What did we say? What do you say? You say happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. Yes. Happy kick Sunday. Oh, oh you're okay. I'm right. still in the chest. In the head. All right, yes. tell them bye. 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 So see you next week. See you next week. Hey, take this to your daddy. What? Silly. Go on. What's this thing for right there? All right. All right. Today we're talking about King Manasseh, the boy who wore a crown. Um, our lesson comes from 2 Kings 21, 1 through 8, and 2 Chronicles 33, 1 through 20. And the backstory to this, um, Manasseh goes all the way back to when God's people couldn't get along, um, when God's people kept fighting, and the kingdoms had to be split. Um, so when we split into the two kingdoms, we had ten kingdoms of Israel, two kingdoms of Judah. Each kingdom, each section, I guess, these twelve, they each had one king. So you had... 12 kings. There's 12 kingdoms. You had 12 kings. One of the kings of Judah. See, Judah would only have two because there was only two parts that were Judah. One was Manasseh. When Manasseh was 12 years old, he was taken, or he wasn't taken. He had to become king. And when I first read that, um, I was sitting here thinking, you know, I've read that before. We knew that before. But the first thing that went through my mind, and I really don't know why it went through my mind, but the first thing that went through my mind was, okay, wow, he's 12 years old. How can a 12-year-old rule this kingdom? How can he know, not say what's right and wrong, but how can he make major decisions? Um, Especially if it comes to battle, when it comes to um, things like that. And I thought, well, of course, he had people that he followed, people that looked up. He had help. But then I took another turn. I thought, you know, I hear a lot these days of, oh, they're too young to do that. They're too young to understand that, especially when it comes to church matters. I might say church matters. That's the wrong thing. When it comes to the Bible, um, we can't study that because that's too deep for them. They're not old enough for that. Or they can't participate in this particular program or this particular activity because they're just not at that level. So where does I even give them a chance? And that really, I guess, kind of changed my viewpoint when I read this. If God could use Manasseh when he was 12 to make him a king... He can use our young kids, and he does use our young kids for examples. Um, They are more mature than what we think, I guess, more mature than what we give them credit for. And I'm not saying that we don't know our own children and what they're capable of, but sometimes, and I'll speak for myself, I hold my kids back. Um, I pull them back. I don't want them to try, or I don't want them to do something that I didn't get to do or that I didn't wasn't ready for them to go into or I don't want to study particular material with them because I don't think they're ready and I've got to stop when I read this I thought you know well maybe I need to reconsider that maybe if again Manasseh was only 12 and he was able to rule and I know we're taking apples and oranges here like I get that but yet I think we need to give our younger children more of a chance um maybe um I don't know what I'm trying to say. You all know where I'm going. But, um, like, I don't want to say give them more credit, but maybe encourage is not the right word, but let them go a little bit farther than what we want them to go. Let them get a little bit deeper than what we want them, what we think they should do, because they're probably ready for it. But this was Manasseh. He was the king of Judah. We know he was the son of Hezekiah, and Hezekiah was a good king. So, good thing. Yay. His daddy was good. He's a good kid. But... He was the grandson of Ahaz. And what was Ahaz? He was a wicked queen, wicked king, one of the most wicked ones. So, okay, now we got split down the middle. Which way is this guy going to go? He had a really good father, but a really bad grandfather. Which way are we going to choose? Manasseh, he reigned for 55 years, and he was the longest reigning king in either of these 12 kingdoms, Um, probably because he was so young. Um, but he had a long term, I'm just going to use term, he had a long term um, as being king. So we know Manasseh, okay, even though he was raised right by Hezekiah, he wasn't that good of a king, okay? He was not God-fearing. He was not God-following. 
Um, he created places to worship false, false gods. Um, we'll recognize the name Baal and Asherah. He built altars for these false gods. So he built places where people could go and worship these false idols. He even built something in the temple that you could go in God's holy place, God's temple, the place where you're supposed to be worshiping God. And he puts up an altar where they could worship a false god. This is how far off he got. 2 Kings 21, 6 um, tells us that Manasseh sacrificed, him, sacrificed his son by burning him on an altar. So this is far, this is how far gone he has went because um, he's done, been in idol worship so much that he even got, I don't want to say roped into, but believed that if he burnt his own son to this God, that that's what they wanted. And he did. He took his own child and burnt him on an altar. He believed in mediums and wizards. And we they were directly told not to believe in, um, I'm going to call it witchcraft. Um, that's Paula's words. They were directly told not to do that in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 18, 9 through 12. Um, it says, when you come into the land which the Lord your God has given you, you shall not learn to follow the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone who makes his son or daughter pass through the fire, or one who practices witchcraft, or a soothsayer, or one who interprets omens, or a sorcerer, or one who conjures spells, or a medium, or a spiritist, or one who calls upon calls up the dead. For all who do these things are an abomination to the Lord. And because of this abomination to the Lord, your God drives them out from before you. So we hear what? Don't, 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 don't. If you do, the Lord's going to drive, drive you out. And this is exactly what Manasseh did. He got so roped up into these false gods. He got so focused on them. He gave his son up. He believed these mediums. He believed these sorcerers. And... He ended up leading. He's the king. People follow the king. They, it's just what they do. And what did they do? He led them away from God instead of to him. And obviously God got angry. God didn't like it. Hezekiah deserved punishment. Well, God kept letting it go on and go on and go on. And we're going to see in a little while. God finally says enough is enough. Some sources even think that when Manasseh was in this, I'm going to call it phase, because we will see later that he turns around. When he's in this phase of his life, some think that Manasseh had Isaiah sawn in two with a wooden saw. Can't get much e much more evil than Hezekiah, okay? He is not doing what he's supposed to do. He's evil. He's hateful. He's hurtful. And the well-known Isaiah the prophet, he they people think that Manasseh sawed him in half with a wooden saw. That's just more painful than you could imagine. But not only was he wicked, he was proud of it. He boasted of it. He was proud of himself. He loved that ego. He loved that big head, so to speak. He loved it. That's not who we should be. Second Chronicles 33, 19 retells everything that Second Kings said about, Hezek about um, Hezekiah. Or, sorry, I keep saying Hezekiah. We're talking about Manasseh. So, everything I said about Hezekiah, just insert Manasseh. Because I have done that all wrong. Hezekiah was good. Manasseh was bad. So, Manasseh was the one who sacrificed his son by burning him on an altar. Manasseh was the one who set up the false idols in God's house. Um, Hez uh, Manasseh was the one who believed in the mediums and the sorcerers. And Manasseh was the one who had Isaiah um, killed with a wooden saw. Uh, Manasseh was the one who was wicked and very proud of it. So that in a nutshell, not Hezekiah, Manasseh. So 2 Chronicles 33-9 tells us about Manasseh as well. Um, it recaps what 2 Kings says, but it goes a little bit deeper. And in verse 10, it says, God warns Manasseh and his people, but they refuse to listen. So God had to do something to get their attention. So God didn't just come down on Manasseh. He didn't just cut him off cold turkey. He gave him chance after chance after chance after chance. He warns him and he warns him and he warns his people, look, it's coming. I'm, we're going to have to stop this. It's coming. You all got to straighten up. And they didn't listen. So God brought down the Assyrian army and he let them capture Manasseh. Now, you're probably thinking, what's so wrong with this? Okay, they captured the king. Oh, well, you know, they'll just get another king. 
Well, you got to think it from Manasseh's standpoint. Manasseh has been treated by royalty since age 12. He is the king. He gets whatever he wants. He probably doesn't have to lift a finger, doesn't have to do anything. He just speaks it and it's done. When he's taken captive, he's a prisoner. He is beaten. He is tortured. He is um, not treated well at all. He's being treated very cruelly. He's getting a taste of his own medicine, so we would say. What he has done to God's people, what he has done to other people, what he has done to his son, they are now doing to him. The Assyrians are doing to him. And he is in their captivity. We do not know for how long, but for quite a while. And so now the tables have turned and Manasseh, um, his royalty is gone. Um, he's no longer a king. They, they don't care. Um, you know, so, I mean, he is a king, but he is captured. So his kingship, his king status is gone. It's revoked. So he's now just a prisoner in their eyes and they're going to treat him like everybody else. Um, in captivity, King Manasseh finally turned to God. He humbled himself. Um, hold on, I don't think that. No, that is not. We ain't there yet. Sorry, I'm just all messed up today. Um, when kings were made captive, they were usually treated with great cruelty. They took Manasseh with hooks, bound him with bronze fetters, and carried him off to Babylon. So it reminds me of what I would call the chain gang. He's in chains, he's in shackles, and he's being led. He's being taken to Babylon, not hidden, in front of everybody. So they see this king who is all royalty. Now he's treated like this. He's treated evil, or not evil. He's treated cruelly, and now it's an embarrassment. It's a punishment to them. We don't know how long this lasted. We are not told how long he was taken captive. We do not know how long it took Manasseh to turn around. But what a blow it must have been to Manasseh. Once treated like royalty, now treated cruelly. But while this terrible thing was happening to him, while he was going through severe punishment, he repented. While he was suffering, he repented. God listened, because why? God's a caring God. What did we talk about last week? God gives second chances. He listened. He brought Manasseh out of captivity, and then Manasseh turned his life around. Just kind of like we said with the guy last week. We don't know if his life was good or bad before he died, but when he got up, he did the right things. He fulfilled his life. One, some of the ways that he turned his life around was he restored the city, he rebuilt the outer wall, and he even went and removed the false gods, the false idols, the altars from the temple which he placed. And not only there, in other places too. He got rid of all the false gods. And not only did he get rid of them, he destroyed them. To where they weren't going to be back. They couldn't be put back together. Um, it wasn't just a spare of the moment thing. He destroyed them. To where they would no longer be there anymore. That's a great turnaround. We went from someone who had everything he could ever want. But he got wrapped up in the wrong gang, if you let me know. He went sideways. He went down the wrong path. He started spiraling out of control. God told him, hey, look, Manasseh, you need to get back on the right track. He didn't listen. So God brought down punishment. While he was suffering, Manasseh says, okay, I'm wrong. I need to turn it around. I've done this, 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 and this. I'm going to change. And he does it. God listens. God lets him come out of captivity. He does what he says he would do. He destroys the false gods. He starts doing things for God again. He rebuilds the outer wall. He starts to restore the city and get them back on the right track. Now that has to be hard because you had your gang, you had your people that were all about you when you were king. They were your right hand people. They were best friends. They see you get taken away. We don't know how long it's been. And what happens to followers? What happens when you take their leader away? They're going to find somebody else to follow. They're going to forget about you. You're not going to be anybody anymore. And then so he's got his work built out for him, worked out for him. Um, when he has to come back, he's still king. He's trying to get this city right. But do you think he's still going to have the same followers as before? 
they're not going to listen to him. He's got, he's lost his friends. They're done following somebody else. And they're probably even deeper into these false gods than what they were when Manasseh left. But with God's help, he turns them around. So there's five things we can learn from Manasseh. Number one, sin is wrong even if everyone is doing it. Wrong is wrong. Just because everybody else, I think of my school days. Well, everybody else is doing it. Why can't I? Well, this whole class is doing it. Why can't I? We hear it from the kids. It's not fair. Why can't I do it? So-so's doing it. Why can't I wear that? So-and-so's wearing that. Why can't I talk like that? It's on here. Why can't I do this, this, this? Wrong is wrong. Manasseh knew that worshiping false gods, false idols was wrong, but he did it. He got in with the wrong crowd. Um, but did that make it right? Just because he was following these other nations, did that make it right? It did not make it right. Um, he was still in the wrong. Um, Exodus, 30, Exodus 23, 2 states, You shall not follow a crowd to do evil. You, you can't get any plainer than that. You can't follow the crowd to do evil. If someone is doing something wrong and you're following them, guess what? You're going to do something wrong. That's just that plain. You have to be careful. It's hard to do right when everyone else is doing wrong, but we're called to do it. Now, does that mean you may have to leave? Yes. Does that mean you may not be able to talk to somebody again? Yes. Does that mean that you're going to be the talk of the work? Yes. Does that mean you're going to be the talk of the church? Probably. Does that mean you're going to be the talk of your family? You better believe it. Does that mean you're going to lose some friendships? Probably. But what's more important? That friendship that's leading you the wrong way or making sure you're right and getting to heaven at the end of the, at the, end of the at your life? You got to think about that. It's easy. It's harder to think about that in the moment because it's so easy. I, I don't want to listen to them. I don't want to be ridiculed. I don't want to be made fun of. I don't want to be the talk. So let me just go along with it this one time. And then that one time turns into a second time and a third time. And then we're not thinking about it anymore. But we got to remember sin is sin. Even if everybody in the entire world is doing it, sin is sin. The second thing we have to remember is sometimes bad things happen to make us realize our need for God. And I've thought about this. Um, I have thought about this. Um, this hit home the last two or three. Um, when bad things happen, um, I'm not, I hate to say death is bad, but when death happens, when you get a bad diagnosis, when, um, you have a friend, a child that strays, that um, doesn't do what they're supposed to do. Um, just bad things. You may have a car wreck. You may, whatever, fill in the blank. Whatever bad things happen, that is the times the most we realize we need God. Like we've said time and time again, it's hard to, not hard, it is easier to remember God in the bad times than it is the good times. So, same thing with Manasseh. When did he really pay attention to when he was doing wrong? When he was in bad times, when he was being treated cruelly. Um, when Hannah's desire for a baby had been denied, she went to the house of the Lord and poured out her deepest longings to God, knowing that only God could fulfill her yearning. Paul often faced death due to his preaching of the truth. Consequently, his hardship made him trust in God all the more. When life is pretty rosy... When everything is rocking right along with no problems, it is easy to become, to become dependent on myself. I might think I have everything under control. I'm doing pretty well for myself. I don't need any help. Then when trouble comes, I'm brought to my knees. I finally grasp my need for God in my life and I turn to him just as Manasseh did. And I think if we're honest with whoever is watching in our lives, when do we hit the rock bottom? That's when we turn to God. When we just, we want to do it our way, when our way fails, then we turn to God. So we have to realize that sometimes bad things are going to happen to us to get us back on the right path, to get us where we need to go. We may not like it. We may not realize it at that exact moment, but bad things may happen. 
um, but we can always learn from them. The third thing, change is possible even for the worst of sinners. This hit home too. Um, we cannot judge. We as Christians need to treat everyone with respect and give them a chance to change. God does. God died for all sinners, not just the good, not just the semi-bad, even the evil ones. And to me, I guess the most evil thing that could happen is you would kill one of my children or kill my husband or kill a family member. Um, that would be probably the greatest sin to me right now. Um, and I thought about it because um, we watch a lot of, right now I'm into this court show, and you see some pretty, which, you know, it's TV, I get that. But if it was real life, you get into some pretty bad things that people do, that people are in court for, that people are being um, accused of, whether they did it or not. And I get to thinking about that, and it's hard for me to think, you know, you think, like I told you, the ultimate sin to me is murdering somebody. And it's hard for me to think that the person, in God's eyes, the person who is a murderer is held to the same standards as mm -hmm. if I go and steal a car or if I steal a pack of gum from the store. Sin is a sin. But in my mind, that murderer has done 20 times worse than me stealing a pack of gum or forgetting to pay for it or it being in the bottom of the cart or whatever and not knowing and not going back in and pay for it. But does God still give me a second chance for not paying that gum? Yes. If that murderer goes to jail, does his time, truly turns his life around, does God forgive him? Absolutely. Absolutely. Again, change is possible for that person. But then I keep saying a murder because, like I said, that is the worst thing to me right now. Change is possible for him. Would we accept that? If someone came and did murder someone we loved, someone in our family, could we accept that they've changed? Would we let them change? Would we be willing to let them change? God does. We do too. We can't judge. We can't judge. Fourthly, God is always willing to forgive if we will come to him. Ephesians 1, 7. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We are never beyond God's love and mercy. God has promised to forgive us of our sins if we obey him. Yes, he's promised it, but there's an if. If we obey him. And God keeps his promises faithfully. God holds up his end. Do we hold up our end? Lastly, even if we repent, we may still suffer consequences of our sins. And this is another one I kind of chuckled at. Um... I thought of apologies. You know, if there's been something really bad that's happened and it has either, I don't want to say destroy the workplace, but has cost you a promotion or has, it's hurt you in some way, it still has repercussions, right? If someone told a lie about you and um, it went all through the workplace, even though it wasn't true, people believe it and it just fed and fed and fed and got bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, that person comes to you and says, I'm sorry, I never should have done that. It comes out that the other person lied. Does that take away all the hurt feelings? Does that take away all the lies that were said? Does that bring that promotion back to you? Does that? Do no. We still have to deal with the consequences of it. Manasseh had to live with the fact that he killed one of his own children. And, and he also, he sacrificed him. Not sacrificed him, he killed him. He also killed some of God's people. He can never forget that. He can never escape that. That will always be what's on his mind. Every day when he wakes up, he's going to know he's killed his own son. But even with that, Manasseh still chose to change his life even though he suffered daily. God never promises we won't suffer. God says we will suffer long. What is long? Is it a week? Is it two years? Is it 10 years? Is it 20 years? He didn't tell Manasseh he wouldn't suffer. He was forgiven. 
Manasseh turned his life around. Manasseh got back on the right track. God was with him. God didn't say you wouldn't suffer. God didn't tell him his suffering would end, that his suffering would end. He suffered. We still will suffer the consequences of our sins, even if we turn our lives back around, even if we make things right. There are some things that we're going to have repercussions from, but we have to make sure that like Manasseh, when we turn our life around, when we repent of our sins, when we get back on the right track, that we stay that way, that we encourage others and that we do what is right. So here, this 12 year old boy, he had a great dad, a not so great grandfather. He started off good, then turned really, really bad. It took God doing something drastic, putting him into captivity, and then bringing him, him realizing, hey, I did something wrong, bringing him back and changing. Um, so that's just what I want to talk about. I did not realize this is almost 30 minutes long. I am sorry. I knew this lesson was long, but I didn't realize it was that long. So next week, we will talk about it's our last chapter in this book. It's Ebed Malek. I don't know. I've checked with Matt on that. And it's beyond the call of duty, and it's going to be in Jeremiah. So we will finish this section next week. And thank you for listening, and have a great week, and I'll see you next